Well, we've come a long way, but I think we've come to acknowledge that elections are an important part of any democratic process. And they are important building blocks leading to, you know, development and, you know, the sustainability of any country. And, and so we've, we've come a long way. As you can imagine, a lot of effort is put to ensuring that elections are held and held successfully. And so we, it's not something that is, is taken lightly. I mean, if you ask beyond football, the single most important process or exercise within a country, elections could really rank you know, at par with football because there's a lot of excitement about it. And of course, also a lot of apprehension, but a lot of interest in elections. And so being managers of elections is important, you know, that you spend a lot of time and effort to ensure that elections are successful, knowing well that they could break, you know, or make the, a nation or the society. And so we've come a long way. I mean, it's and as the, it's, it's evolving and lots of efforts are being put in place to improve upon each and every election. And so in a sense, you can say that, you know, the elections that succeed in Africa have really become like the gold standard and could be, you know, other countries could model, in, in the West could model their elections around successful elections in Africa. I believe so. I believe the stakes are so high, and so you find the tendency of the leaders, you know, there's a tendency of the leaders making statements that the elections could be rigged and they would not accept the outcomes if it's not in their favor, and then they would only accept it if it's in their favor. So you do find that. But I believe that, you know, and I'll share the example of Ghana, the processes you know, leading to the elections are so transparent and therefore and open to the general public and any interested citizen could really follow it process by process. It's very open, it's very transparent. The media is involved, you know, and they showcase the various processes, you know, to the citizenry. And so I think in Ghana, for instance, you know, it, it helps to water down the perception or d diminish the perception that elections can be rigged because we've gone out of our way to really open up our processes, you know, to the general, to the general public. But of course, I mean, I think because the stakes are so high, there's always a lot of tension around it and a lot of suspicion. And it's, all, it's important that, you know, pe persons at the helm of affairs where in electoral commissions and elections, take a lot of effort to ensure that you know the processes are open and transparent to give that comfort to the citizenry and I think that is key and so you find that if a political figure a politician even makes the statement that the elections will be rigged because the processes are so transparent it would not raise alarm and you know call, create tensions and unnecessary suspicions in the country. Well, I think it's really, the, the rules are clear and we do have the guidelines. And for us in Ghana, what we've done is we have a platform that we call the Interparty Advisory Committee. It's a platform, it's a voluntary platform that brings together the leadership of the parties and the EC regularly, uh, you know, to discuss and dialogue on various aspects of our electoral process. And so, you know, once the EC comes up with programs and plans, it, you know, the parties come around it and they provide input and feedback. Although the feedback is not binding on the commission, it's, you find that very often you receive constructive feedback that helps to strengthen your work. And so that process of inclusion, where the parties have the opportunity to contribute and to, you know, air their views and also to hear from the EC, creates the ownership of the process, you know, and so ultimately you find that the, the, you know, the rules and the guidelines 
have, you know, they, they have fed into it. They've made their inputs and shared their insights. And so there's that joint ownership. And so it's very difficult for them then to say that we do not abide by the rules because although they are, you know, the insights they share are not binding, very often you find that some constructive feedback is given and the EC takes it on and embraces their suggestions and adds it on to its work. So ultimately you have a collective, you know, agreements and guidelines that are owned by you know, the parties. And so that's the approach that we've taken. And you rightly said, I worked with the IEA. I was, I served there as head for, you know, many years. And there I worked closely with the political parties, bringing them to the table regularly under a program called the Ghana Political Parties Program. And it brought together, you know, various sides of the political divide. But along the same, you know, methodology to you know, bring set, bring them together on a set of ideas and some agenda and have them contribute jointly. And so there's that sense of ownership and you find that the political divide is, is very, you know, fades away because everybody wants to contribute and everybody wants, you know, to be part of a good process. And we had many bills coming through. I think one of the last bills that was passed in, into law when I was there was a presidential transition bill. We didn't have such a bill in Ghana, but together with the parties, we were able to work to develop it. And, you know, you find that you bring them together, they, you know, and they work together well. Once they have the opportunity to contribute, they work together very well. And it takes away, you know, the tensions, the suspicions and the accusations and so on. And so it's a similar, you know, approach that we have at IPAC. IPAC has been in existence for a long time. It's, you know, and so, you know, and it's, it's a similar approach. Indeed, you know, we never had, of course, we never had a real transition until I believe it was 2000. When, because as, as you may be aware, we had had many military, you know, dictatorships. So we had been under military rule until 1992. And so we didn't have a first real transfer of power from one government to the next and until, until, from one government to another until 2000. And so we went into that transition without guidelines. And it was quite messy. It was very murky and unclear. And, you know, people went home with documentation. There was no documentation. There was no handover of, you know, power in, in, in the sense of the, the transfer of documentation, information from the outgoing government to the incoming government. And it was then where at the IEA we felt that, no, 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 we had to close this lacuna. There was a lacuna and we had to close this with a, a draft bill. It was a beautiful experience because you know, once you bring them together, and in the case of the presidential transition bill, they worked very, very closely. You don't see the political lines. You know, they, I think their focus is to achieve and to produce that bill, to work with the institute, the IEA, to produce that bill. And so you don't see the political lines. They share ideas, they share jokes. They, they work very, very well together. And as you may be aware, that bill led you know, was laid before Parliament and, you know, was passed into law. So it's a cur it currently is an act, and that's what guides, you know, the transition process. So this is something that, you know, I've had experience working for close to 18 years, having been at the IE, working with the leadership of the political parties, and of course the leadership of Parliament as well, to ensure the passage of some of these bills that we have worked with. And, and you're right, you know, it's one of the bills that we developed with the political parties when I was at the IEA many, many years ago. And it's still a bill. It's never been passed into law. And I think one of the key challenges with campaign financing is the transparency. Unfortunately, we've not been able to, even in Ghana, to develop, you know, a law or a system that you know, and, and ensures the accountability on the part of the political parties. And therefore, 
you know, even though in Ghana they present us with their audited accounts, it's what they say. There's no transparency around it. If you look at, you know, the number of billboards and T-shirts and rallies and the funds that go into these things, and you compare it to, you know, the financial audited reports that you receive, it, it, just, it just doesn't add up. And that's the, for, for me, the biggest challenge is the f transparency. Where are these funds coming from? And how are political parties funding these campaigns? I think that's the biggest challenge, and we've not been able to resolve it in Ghana. We do not have a law around campaign financing, although, as I mentioned, the IEA had produced one when I was there under my leadership with the Ghana Political Parties Programme. It never, it's never seen the light of day and it's not been passed into law. And so we continue to operate in that secrecy, you know, and, and the lack of transparency and accountability. Because our laws state that you cannot receive funding from outside, you know, political parties and cannot receive external funding, you know, but we are not able to track it. We are not able to determine where these monies are coming from and, and that sort of thing. And so it's, it's, it's an issue. Unfortunately, you, there's that sense of disillusionment amongst, you know, you, you find that people feel disillusioned. And I'm very sure that it will lead to voter apathy in the long run, where people feel there's no point in going to exercise my franchise. But I still think that democracy is the best form of government. And because we've had, you know, long periods of coup d'etats and we've had to live under military dictatorship and you it's if you haven't tasted it you can say that oh let's have a coup and it's a no 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 I think democracy is still the best form of government and I believe that you know with with time the citizens would find ways to hold their governments to account beyond you know you know just changing you know, them on election day. I think with time, people should demand, you know, accountability from, from their governments, and democracy allows them to do that. If you're under a military dictatorship, you will not be able to demand accountability. But I believe that democracy allows the citizens to demand accountability and to get them to, you know, to implement programs and projects that would, you know, benefit the citizenry. You know, so I, I believe that although there's, uh, you feel the disillusionment when you speak to people, they feel, well, I'm not going to vote this year, you know, and I'm not interested in it because nothing is changing, you know, it's still the best form of, of government. And I believe that with time we will see that. But it's important that we develop other ways of holding our governments to account beyond just on election day when you vote them in or out. We've got to find other ways of demanding that they, they serve the interest of the citizenry because it's for their, that reason, that's why they, they are in power. Well, I think you, I believe that you, I, I came to this with, you know, with the resolve to work within the confines of the law and to walk that tight rope within the confines of the law and not to be aligned to to any of the any of the of the political parties and so once you come to the position with that sense of integrity you know determined to ensure that the will of the people is what is that is what stands you can go to bed and sleep in peace Everything else is noise. You should, I believe that, and what, that's how I see it. I, you know, I came to this position determined and resolved to do right by the people and to ensure that their votes count and that their will is what is reflected in, in the outcomes. And so, you know, definitely you find a lot of noise, a lot of agitation and pressure and so on. But I can show you, Gareth, that because you've of that and, and with that level of transparency everybody sees everything that is happening and so you may be aware that we replaced our voters register 
in, in 2020. And with a lot of resistance from the main opposition party, they were everywhere. They resisted that move. But we felt as a commission that the founda fundamental document, the foundation document, had to be credible. And there were challenges with the register. A report had revealed that prior to our appointment, I think in 2016, that the register had challenges. And so we felt that if you want to have a credible outcome, credible elections and credible outcomes, then the foundation document had to be right. And so despite the resistance, we went ahead to, change, to prepare a new register within the confines of the law and opened up the process to the extent that any interested party could, sitting on their couch, collate the number of persons who had been registered per day by making available that information, not only to the political parties, but also to the citizenry. And so we, you find that on a daily basis, the political party agents are given a printout of the number of registrants at each polling station. And we use that, we also prepare that information into infographs and pr present it to the citizens. So it was on our website and you know, so on and so So anybody who had interest could sit in their homes, in the comfort of their homes, and collate. And so you didn't have the question of, oh, we, we, we are, the number of persons registered uh, that the EC has put out is higher than what we have. No, it was transparent. So I think that's the key. If you want to have peace of mind as a chair, you've got to lead a commission that is open, that is transparent, and you have to involve all the stakeholders and not just the political parties because we've come to realize that sometimes you are in with political parties in a room in the room you have discussions and conclusions and then they go out and the story is very different from what you've concluded so you you are better off opening up to the entire you know the citizenry and any interested citizen should you know should be able to follow what you are doing and so this is the approach that we took and so you really go to bed in peace. So I think the Association of African Election Authorities is important because it's, it's a body, it's an association that brings together the chairpersons of election management bodies in Africa. And it provides an avenue for the sharing of lessons and experiences, and also really to provide that peer-to-peer -peer support and you know, advice in, in, time, in time of need. Additionally, it also offers the opportunity of you know, technical experience to you know, peers who may, may need it. And so it's a peer-to-peer -peer sort of exchange. And you, know, you, you couldn't get it better than that because you've all been through similar experiences and so you can always rely on the experiences of your peers in, in spite of the fact that we have different political con contexts you can still i believe the challenges are really pretty much the same so it's that that's the importance of the association that peer-to-peer -peer support which you may not be able to get from anybody around you and so on election day you can you know, have this. You can phone any of your peers and say, "Well, I'm experiencing. I have this challenge. Have you? Have any of you had a similar experience? How did you deal with it?" And that person may say that follow the law. And I give the example. I remember on election day, you know, just two days after the election, when we were getting ready for the declaration of the results. I think f within 48 hours, you know, I started receiving very a number of calls saying that you know they were you know the main opposition party had found issues with some of the figures that had been declared and therefore they wanted to to have a meeting with me so the the, the declaration should not go on and there was a lot of pressure coming from outside mind you the process of the collation of the results starts from the polling station and it's done in the full glare of the public. And I have been, I've observed many an election when I was at the IE. And so you go into the polling station and it's counted. You know, you, you start counting, they sort out the votes for the parties and then they shout one and everybody's two and we're everybody three and it's very open. 
and then the process is documented and copies of the collation sheet is posted on the wall at the police station level. And then you come to the constituency and you follow the same process. Under my leadership, we, we, we introduced a regional collation center. In, in the past, it ended at the constituency. And so all the results from 275 constituencies would come to the National Collation Center. But we thought that was very untidy. It was a long, messy, you know, untidy process where you have three, four days waiting for 275 results. So what we introduced were the regional collation centers to introduce another level of scrutiny and inclusion by the parties, for the parties to be included at that level as well. And so if a region has 40 constituencies, all those results will go to the regional collation center and they, they tidy it up. The parties have another layer there to scrutinize and to check to ensure that everything is in order before they sign. And so instead of 275 results coming in, you have 16 coming in from 16 regions, and the parties have had the opportunity to go through it. And so, you know, just before declaration, a lot of pressure coming in that, oh, no, the, the main opposition wants to have a meeting with you. You must stop. Don't declare. But what does the law say? The law says that anybody who has an issue with the results should go to court. It's, you do not resolve it at the electoral commissioner's office, and you don't resolve it with the chair once it's come up. Of course, you've had the opportunity, at the, from, right from the polling station level, you've had opportunity to do the recounts where there are issues. So the law allows you to do call for recounting and to call for correction at the polling station level. Then you go to the constituency level, you have the opportunity to do that. Then you go to the regional level, you have the opportunity to do that. But once the results come up, you know, and, you know, they've been certified, you know, it's not, you don't have the opportunity to open up and start having discussions with parties. At that level, anybody who has a problem should go to court. And so we, I followed the law. So you need to, as a commissioner, you, you must be resolute. You must, you know, be open to... To, to receive, you know, people's views and so on. But you must ensure that you are working within the confines of the law because your actions or inactions could really, you know, undermine and derail a good, you know, democratic process and undermine the stability of, of a country. And so, I, and, and so this was a typical example where we said, no, 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 no. We, you know, we've come all the way, and you, you haven't. We need to be provided with evidence. We cannot be holding meetings. The law doesn't permit us. If you have any issues, you can go to court. And so, as you know, the main opposition went to court, but did not provide a single piece of evidence. And and the the, the court determined at the end of the day that you know the their petition was without merit. Well, you know, the elections and the results have nothing to do with, you know, with the individuals at the top. They, like the citizenry, have one vote to cast. But it's important that there's that unity amongst commissioners. And, I mean, it's, it's important that commissioners work together. There's a good understanding of the law. There's a good understanding of the process and there's, you know, and there's unity as to how we are going to go about it. And so it's important that throughout the process, you know, we, commissioners work within the confines of the law because I, the, the collation process and the declaration process is determined by law. And so if, you know, a, a, a commissioner is going along those lines and others disagree, then it's too bad for them. You know, then you don't, if they, they disagree. So long as you are working within the confines, and this is what the law says, and you have worked along those lines, then if others disagree with you at a point, too bad for them. Well, very much so. I think that there's lots of lessons to be learned there, and you know, maybe basically, like you're saying, to understand what went wrong 
you know, what has gone wrong with, you know, and, and I'll use the example of why, why the divisions in Kenya, what happened along the line, was there a breach of, you know, procedure that everybody had agreed to, you know, and I think that, I mean, these are lessons that, you know, we should look, look at and learn from because it doesn't, it doesn't give comfort. And granted, you know, the, the, there was a court case and, you know, the declaration of the, the chairman was upheld, but, you know, you, you want to have a tidy, you know, a tidy, you know, process. And, and so these are things that we should, we should look at and to find out what went wrong. From where we sit, we've only read things in the media, so we don't know whether indeed that that is that is it not you know not all the time you know not all the time as you know we are funded you know by the government of ghana through the consolidated fund and we our budgets are approved by the committee of parliament the special budget committee of parliament but you know it's not often that we receive our funds on time you know so Basically, yeah, we don't. Well, I haven't thought of that, but in Ghana we've had discussions, again, when I was at the IE of having a, a special fund for the Electoral Commission where funds are paid into. And so you don't have well in advance and so it's, so it's basically similar to what you are saying, but this is at the, at the national level, so that you don't have to struggle for funds and you don't have to go through the consolidated you know, fund, but a special fund where monies are paid into, and of course, you still be accountable for every penny. And you know, some you know, guidelines to be, should be clearly set out for the accountability, and it shouldn't be different from what we do currently. You know, but it really would speed up and help with planning and also even with, with the cost of elections. Because if you receive your funds on time, it would allow you to, you know, start your procurement on time and start your activities on time. And it gives you room to, you know, review and scrutinize and, you know, you know the various procurement prices and, 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 and that sort of thing. Very often when things are done late, you are left with no option but that to make quick decisions. And that may not augur well for, you know, the financial sustainability of the organization. And basically that's, that happens quite often. I think it's, this is a time, as you said, that women you know, should take their place, their rightful place also in leadership, you know, whether in, in politics or the help in, in, in various organizations. And you're right to say that for many centuries, men have led, you know, and there's evidence to show that, you know, when women lead, you, you, you find that things get, re they are, get, you get better results and a lot of, you, a lot more things are achieved. And I mentioned yesterday, I think the question was raised that how is that, why is it that when women lead and, you know, they, they do better. And I mentioned that, well, you find very few women at the helm of affairs and most of them have come there by dint of hard work, not because of who they know per se. And so once you, you select, you know, any of those women, the few, the 10% are the helm of affairs, you, it's like, there's a likelihood that they, they would deliver, you know. And I, I believe that this is a time to allow, to open up for more women to, in, to, to enter the political space and, and, and to lead in, in various aspects of, you know, the, any country's political life. Yes, I think they, I'd say to them that there's, and especially with a young girl, that there's, there's hope and they shouldn't give up, and that they should give of their best and at the right time they would shine and that they should not be intimidated, you know, but they should continue 
you know, to work hard and to put in place the building blocks, you know, and to position themselves, uh, you know, for, for leadership. Because at the right time, you know, they will shine and they will be provided, you know, they will have the opportunity to, to lead. So basically, that's what I'll say to, you know, the, the, to, to young people, that they, they shouldn't give up because they, 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 they are the future, you know, and they should not despair and sit at home and do nothing because if they do nothing, then they, they, they cannot lead. But they should burn the midnight oil and put in place, you know, the building blocks and work hard because there will be a time when they will take over the helm of leadership. And so that's what the message I would send to them. Mm-hmm.